I'm helping some people. Philippians chapter 2, going to start in verse 12. Where for my beloved, this is the epistle by Paul to the Philippians. He says, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. I'm going to be honest with you. This next phrase in my theology I struggle with. I think the Lord has helped me with some understanding. Is work out your salvation with fear and trembling. He doesn't stop there. For it is God which worketh, everybody say, in you. It is God who does the inside work, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Let me break that down. His will is the blueprint. The good pleasure is the construction. There's a whole lot of difference in what they draw on paper and what we build in person. Isn't that right, Brother Braswell? There's a difference between a blueprint and what gets done on the job. I'm going to preach about that in just a minute. Notice there's a conjunction in my Bible. Do all things without murmuring and disputing. If you read that in the NIV, I think it says without grumbling and complaining. Hmm. Did I just say that? Who in here enjoys hard work? Who in here grumbles when it don't go like we planned? Who in here has hit an obstacle? You got metric and it's all standard. Feel the Holy Ghost. I want to preach out tonight how we work it out without fear and trembling. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to tremble. Okay, I'm going to explain that in just a second. Tonight, who wants to hear from the Lord? Jesus, tonight, anoint our ears to hear, encourage our hearts to receive, equip us to be able to fulfill your good and perfect will in our lives, and let the church say amen, and give God a hand clap of praise tonight as you are seated. I, I was reminded, uh, I don't think any of you ever had the privilege of meeting my, uh, my dad's mother. Uh, she was a card. She's just an interesting person, hilarious in a lot of ways. And she had a sister that was a couple of years younger, but could have been her doppelganger. They were, people thought they were twins, but they were a few years apart. They looked that much alike. And so it got listed in the Florence newspaper, Florence, Alabama, where she lived most of her life. It got reported it was really her sister who won a prize at Sears. Now, for the younger audience, Sears is Amazon that didn't deliver. Am I helping y'all at all? Thank you, Preach. And she went into Sears. My Aunt Opal went into Sears, but she looks so much like my grandmother. My grandmother was, like Brian said, she was an extrovert. That's probably where I get it. And she did meet a stranger. She was an honorary lieutenant governor of Alabama because she could rally the votes at election time. She was a union shop steward because she had the support of her coworkers. She was just one of those people. And so everybody in town knew her, but they didn't realize she had a sister. And my, my grandmother was more optimistic, my Aunt Opal, at times. Uh, I had seen a couple times she was negative. She was, a, she was a good lady. Loved my Aunt Opal. Her and Uncle Coleman were so good to us. But I said that to say she went in to Sears and the manager stopped her and pinned a rose on her lapel and handed her a $100 bill. And she said, what is this for? He said, we're honoring you today in the state of Alabama, your Sears one millionth customer. Wow, one millionth customer. She said, Oh, thank you very much. And so the newspaper reporter says, ma'am, what was, you, you won this award, you got this flower, you've been recognized, why did you come in here? She said, I was headed to the complaint department. And it got reported that it was my grandmother. Anybody here got a doppelganger? It really wasn't you who said it, or did it, or posted it? 
I had an experience last year. I was frustrated. Have you ever had your, your, your mouth just water, just taste, you could just taste that meal? And you get there and they're closed. And it just flew all over me. And I said, I'll never come back here again. And one of our dear precious saints called me, oh, pastor, you, I don't think you should do, I don't really think that's what you should be doing. And it stung a little bit. And I recoiled, and I had a revelation, and I went in there and deleted that post. You mean pastor makes mistakes? Pastors fail not because they forget their pastors, but because we forget we're humans. And most of us miss an opportunity to reach and impact people because we're inflexible and unwilling to admit it. Oftentimes when pastors make mistakes, they know it and you know it, that they're in denial and you're not. Let that sink in a minute. I bring that up for a very specific reason. The struggle I've had with this passage, and it all flows together. It's like this, work out your own salvation. I struggle with that. When I was a teenager, there was a very popular song on the radio. It wasn't popular in my house, but it was popular enough that I heard it inadvertently. It was a song by George Jones. You know it must be awesome if it was by George Jones, right? If you didn't drink before, you would drink after because it's so sad. Sorry, Sister Mary, I'm just picking. Here's what I'm saying. Me and Jesus got our own thing going. Doctrinally, that is not accurate. There are not many ways to God. There's not your contract, my contract, an Iris contract, Matt's contract, Brian's contract. We don't negotiate our own individual deal. That's not accurate. But when you read this verse, let everyone work out their own salvation, that seems to open the door that you, they, you can negotiate your own deal. That is not accurate. And so I really sought and prayed. I struggled with this passage of Scripture for a long time. And then the Lord opened it up. It is amazing when you pray. It is amazing when you dwell on the Word of the Lord and when you ask the Lord how He'll open the Scriptures to you. If you look in 14, excuse me, 13, He says, For God which worketh in you. Let me say it this way. The reality I had is that God does the inside work. He takes the old man and he births the new man. He takes the old dirty you and makes the clean you. He makes a new you on the inside. But as J.D. Sumner said, if you come to the Lord an idiot, when you get saved, you ain't nothing but a saved idiot. There is a process of learning and applying who in here remembers the night you received the Holy Ghost? Did it automatically make you a whiz with managing money? Did it automatically make you wise and super smart and everybody wanted to come to you for the... No! There was an external process. Who in here admits you don't use the same words today that you used before the Lord? Who admits you don't have the same thoughts today you did before you came... Who in here admits you dress different and walk different and forgive different and save different and spend different? That's what it means. But it doesn't happen at once. The revelation I had was like that construction analogy. God maps it out and does the work on the inside. But let every man do what? Work out. For the Dallas, do you remember helping me back last year? at the old uh, Asian restaurant, which is now Slick Pig. He does not remember what he said to me. I can still tell him where he was standing. He is a master plumber. He's a pipe fitter. He can do almost anything. He's very, very learned, very gifted. And he rubbed his chin like this. That means he's thinking. He's rubbing his chin like this, and he says, Well, brother, I'll just tell you. I'd rather tear it all out is to do this retro work. The hot water heart heater is already here, and where we need it is over here, but because it's already there and it needs to be here, i got to make it fit. Who knows that God has already established heaven? He's already seen you in the earth. 
But what you got to do is work on you to get yourself in a place that you will come congruent. Who's ever worked with plumbing? That's frustrating. From a distance, a three-quarter and a half inch looks the same from a distance. I would have bet money that was a two and a half inch drain and you get all the way home from Home Depot. When I go to Home Depot and I check out, they'll say, have a nice day. I said, don't worry, you'll see me two or three more times before the day's over. When we talk about work it out, I'm telling you, God does an instantaneous work of grace and he does a miraculous move in your body to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness, but then you got to start working it out. My sink's here, my hot water heater's here, and somewhere up in the ceiling, i got to make a meet up. And I've been guilty of shark biting some connections. That's, that's a cheater's way of not having to solder copper pipes and I get me some shark bites and I get it and I get there and I got three quarter here and half inch here I can tell we don't have plumbers here because y'all gonna do what that's two different sizes it ain't gonna I don't care how awesome your hot water heater is I don't care how awesome your sink is but if you can't make a connection the word is saying do whatever it takes to bring yourself to a place heaven's already established He's not going to move it. The earth is his footstool. How are we going to get from the footstool to heaven? We're going to work it out. Who in here admits that your own self impedes your success? Anybody here born with two left feet? Only thing you can dribble is on your chin. Anybody here admit that? You don't have all that upper body strength. You don't have all the wisdom. You don't have it all figured out. You don't have charisma. Now, I've said that to say, God works in us as individuals, but as an individual, he does the internal work, and he's given us the blueprint, but it's our job to bring our life into conformity to his word and his will. His good worketh in you. He's expecting you to make the application outside. Now, let me ask a question. Why do you think verse 14 is there? In my Bible, there, there's, there's an indent there, and it applies that it's a new passage, but I went back to the, the uh, Greek, and it was added for our benefit translation. It's not really in the original transcript. So let me just tell you, uh, 12 and 14 do have connection. Do all things without murmuring and disputations or disputing. How about if I said without grumblings and complainings? Who in here admits you are susceptible to grumbling and complaining? I've already established I am. Do you understand what complaining does to your ability to bring your life under subjection? There is a connection between grumbling and complaining and subjection in our lives. Brother Ryan, can I pick on you? Come forward. I want you to be a witness tonight. He's nervous. I love it when he's nervous. I pick on him, number one, because I can get away with it. Number two, I know he checks several boxes in my subject matter. Now, you have two daughters. The oldest daughter is eight. And what is her name? Emery. Okay. And so, Brother Brian, what might you and Sister Sarah fix uh, on a morning that you have some time, you fix a breakfast. What might might it consist of? French toast. Ooh, come here, man. French toast. Waffles. Waffles. Bacon, eggs. Bacon, eggs. What are y'all doing in the morning? I'll be over about 8.30. I tell you what sounds. I could eat breakfast food three times a day. I'm telling I love it. Okay, as you can tell, I love it. Now, I know this would never happen, but now do you love your daughter, Emery? Okay, a little bit? whole lot, okay. And so you went out of your way to make French toast and bacon, confectioner sugar, cinnamon, Mrs. Butterworth. I'm feeling it, y'all. Come on. I trained this boy well. Now, let me ask this. If you hear out of the child you love, this French toast is kind of soggy, what's that going to make you do? Uh, Not going to feel very good. 
probably be a little angry. A little angry. What if she says, this bacon's kind of too crispy? How you going to feel? Mm, again, not very good and probably a little irritated. So if you forgot to put her confection of sugar on there, oh, baby, I'm sorry. Daddy forgot. Does God forget? Does God withhold good gifts and precious gifts from his children? So you're human. You're created in the image and the likeness of God. And so when you complain, how do you think your heavenly father perceives that? And you know how you as an earthly father perceives it with memory, right? How do you perceive it? What do you think about her? Oh, I love her. But I perceive that she's ungrateful. Oh, and what else? Unappreciative. Uh-huh, keep going. How does it make you feel? Oh, it makes me irritated. Yeah. Probably makes God irritated. And it makes you want to go cook her something else, right? What does it make you want to do? You go eat every. Come on, right there. Where'd you learn that? That's right. Where do you think? Thank you, Brother Brian. Give him a hand. Yeah. We didn't rehearse that, did we? As you can tell, we didn't rehearse that. Okay. The point is. If we know that our earthly mother or father could be disconcerted, that's a nice word there, irritated, frustrated, even pushed to the point of anger, why do we continue to complain thinking we're going to change God? Example. Has anybody here ever needed to come up with $1,000 for something, $500, the large amount. Okay. Now, Brother Brian and I can both need to come up with $1,000. We're, we're going to Maui. Ladies, just like, we're going to Maui. That's what we're doing. Okay, we're going to, and we need $1,000, yeah. It's one of those ministry things, yes. Amen. Okay. Now, Brother Brian might choose to have a yard sale. Is there anything wrong with having a yard sale? No. Okay. I might choose to work overtime. Is there anything wrong with working overtime? What's our goal? Thousand dollars. How we get there is working it out. But if we complain about it, how does that help us achieve our goal? It is a deterrent to reaching our goal. God works inside. He's expecting us to work outside. But if we grumble and complain, anybody met a complainer? What are we really saying to God? I don't like where I'm at. I don't value what you expect. I'm an ingrate. Okay. I saw a great definition. Who's ever heard the definition of a positive person? The glass is what? A negative person. Glass is half empty. I read a new one on a complainer. You know you're a complainer if you're given a glass that's half filled with water their perception is the glass is half empty. It has a chip on the edge. It's pro I'll probably get an infection. That's a smudge. I bet it's tap water. I specifically asked for bottled water. Why does this always happen to me? Zig Ziglar said it this way. He said, the more you complain, the more you will have to complain about. Now, not everybody's going to agree with what I'm fixing to say, but I will tell you as sure as I'm standing here that complaining does not draw the attention you desire. It actually causes other people to flee from you. Who in here wants to be heard? Who wants somebody to understand where you're at and what you're going through? And complaining is a way to express that. But you don't get the results you're looking for because the people that oftentimes have the power to do something about it are turned off. Brother Brian, did you have the power to do something about Emory's food? Were you motivated and inspired to do something about it? Because of the ungratefulness of her nature, it caused you to just shut the bowels of mercy. Now, can we also be honest that, well, y'all look really nervous. Complaining, having that grumbling, complaining part of you running amok in your life is also a way of making excuses. I worked with a guy. Sister Cabana, it's a fact I'm telling you with my hand up right there. 
That's a fact, I'm telling you. I worked with the guy, and no matter, I showed up on the job, no matter what tools I gave him and how much time I gave him, I would always come back, and it would never be completed. I said, hey, man, what's the problem? It was never him. Well, this roller you gave me, or this brush you gave me, or this material you gave me, or this time frame you gave me, or this helper, is always something. Why he couldn't succeed. Do you know what? That guy never could do anything. He spent all his time, he used complaining as an excuse why he couldn't perform. Who in here admits that we use complaints as why we can't produce? Traffic was awful. But you could have left earlier. I had to get gas. You could have done that the night before. We tend to use complaints as our excuse. Now, coming to a bigger point. Here it comes. Johns Hopkins Research literally released a paper supporting with facts of a 30-year study that Perpetual complainers live shorter lives and have a poorer quality of the life they do have. I want you to know, it stood out to me last week on my on my phone. I was watching these little short Facebook videos of people that are crawling out of rubble in Nashville and Cookville and Lebanon and Mount Juliet, their houses are destroyed, their neighbors' houses are destroyed, everything they have is gone. Now, if you're going to complain, that'd be a good opportunity. And one after another after another of these people that literally crawled out of the only spot of the house that wasn't totally blown away, I just want to thank God. Now, I'm sitting there thinking, boy, if you was going to complain, this would be your venue and your opportunity. I don't understand why this happened. How could God let this happen to me? And complain, complain, complain. I just want to thank the Lord. One guy was asked by the media. They're not very sensitive sometimes. Well, how could you be thankful? He said, you don't understand. I have a seven-year-old little boy. He's alive. His best friend lived two doors down, and that dad's going to be burying his child in a couple of days. What am I saying? We find the ability to complain because we're looking at the wrong thing. When we're looking not about what we don't have, but focused on what God has already blessed us with, it is easy to be thankful for what we have. Let me give you a breakdown here. Three basic things why people tend to complain. It's going to be kind of helpful for them. Number one, most complainers don't even realize they are complaining. It has become a habit. They don't even realize they're negatively complaining. I have a very good ministry friend. He had a very serious condition as a child. It was a respiratory issue. And from that, I believe he is fearful of anything. Uh, any sinus drainage or any allergy stuff getting into his lungs. And so he's constantly making this noise. I didn't do that very well, did I? I think I hurt myself there a little bit. If you sit in an office with him very long, he's talking, you better not dial into that because you will go crazy because in the course of an hour, it'll be a 30 or 40 of those. I try to make our conversations brief. I bring that up not to believe. I see how he got there. He's, he is concerned about his overall. But it's become a, he don't even realize he's doing it. He's constantly doing it. He don't realize it. He, he, he got there through another circumstance. Number two, uh, some people feel like complaining, finding that negative conversation point, is a good conversation starter. You can usually find anybody to talk to you about what's wrong. Politics. The weather, when it's hot, it's too hot. When it's cold, it's too cold. When this person's in, we're looking for the other person in the office and complain, complain, and complain. And I will tell you, it, it's, a good, it's a good common ground, but do you really want to converse with people that are so easily attracted to negative conversation? 
Now, I spent a lot of time fishing the Tennessee River. There's every kind of fish in the Tennessee River. I could catch fish every time with that red worm. But about half the fish I cut were trash fish. And I complained about catching this old trash fish. And my dad said, well, if you didn't use that very common baseline bait, you wouldn't attract the lowest common denominator fish. I thought, And if you use the basis part of conversation to uh, make conversation, don't be surprised the conversation you have. It's common. Three, some people want validation for what they believe. They share their complaint to see if anybody else, here it is. See, they think like I think. They feel like I feel. It don't matter if they feel that it doesn't make it right. I can find a bunch of people to agree with me. don't mean it's right. There's some people who believe in the Easter Bunny. Jewel and I had a neighbor put aluminum foil on his head. He thought the Martians were coming any day. He believed it. He was a part of one of these groups that met and discussed alien life forms. Don't mean they're right. I don't care how many people you get to agree with. Now, sometimes... Boy, it's quiet in here. I'm almost done. Would you agree that negative, critical thinking, complaining is kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy? The more we, we talk about how bad things are, how bad things become. Who's noticed the stock market this week? Anybody notice the stock market this week? Was it up or down? No. I can't get that one. Was it down because of positive, optimistic talking? No, it was down because of what? And experts begin to speak out of a position of negative fear. Then they begin to complain about government agencies and systems that were in place. Now, what did that do to the market? The more they talk negative, the more they complain about it, guess what? Now, if we can understand that about financial markets, why can't we understand about that with the spiritual nature? God has called us to work out our salvation. But now I'm going to be plain for just a minute. Uh, I adapted a military principle here years ago, and that is if you come to me with a complaint, you better also come to me with a solution. People who want to complain, it may make you feel better than the rest of us have to wipe that off of us and go do something about changing it. Complaining without solution is a waste of time, okay? we got to be results-oriented. Now, here I am going to be negative about being negative. I better be careful about that. Do you remember the... Children of Israel, because they began to mur- began, the Bible says, to murmur because of the way. Then after they murmured, that's kind of like under your own breath. Who's ever mumbled? I can still hear my dad. I'd be halfway down the hallway. What'd you say? Nothing. That's what I thought you said. I didn't like what he told me I could or could not do or told me I had to get done. What'd you say? But notice, they began to murmur because of the way, but then that kind of germinated and grew into open rebellion, and they attacked Moses as their leader in the world. Can I give you all a lesson? If Moses is the only one that God is talking to and through for our provision and our protection, I wouldn't be putting him down. (laughs) I'd be fluffing his pillows, what I'd be doing. He's the only one that has a direct communication with the God who's brought us out here. And if he don't carry us through, are we going to be able to make it? But they begin to murmur. Be very careful. The Bible tells us that they complained. And then what did God do? He says, oh, they are right. I forgot. I forgot. I should have sent some Perrier ahead. I should have sent some little fans with little misters on there. I should have sent them some parasols. and other. What was I thinking? Is that what God said? Bless their hearts. They don't like Moses. Let me get them somebody else. Is that what he said? 
Emory, you don't like French toast. Daddy will throw that in the trash. Don't worry about those kids in China starving. I'll fix you anything you want. Is that what daddy said? No. I, I kind of know him. I got a feeling he duct tapered to that chair. You ain't getting out there until you eat this. I don't like it. I don't want it. You're going to eat it. Did God just say, you're right. You're complaining. Got the message home. I was so wrong. Please forgive. Is that what God did? The Bible says he sent fiery serpents. In other words, if you're going to complain, let me give you something to complain about. See, God don't want us sitting down having a pity party and complaining about our circumstance. God wants us to get up and put one foot in front of the other and walk by faith, not by sight, and know that the same God that brought us through the Red Sea is going to carry us over the Jordan. He's already got a place for us. We're going to eat produce that we didn't plant. We're going to reap benefits that we didn't cultivate. And the same God that brought us out is going to carry us through. No, no, I don't like this old manna. Remember that? This old light bread. Guys, I'd love to go to the kitchen every morning and a fresh loaf of bread be sitting there waiting. Up. You can believe what you want to believe. You have the right to be wrong. I can't back this up. It's just it's, it's food for thought. Somebody says, what, what, does, what did manna taste like? Well, I, I don't know. I, I kind of like pizza on Tuesday. Kind of like fish on Friday. Kind of like a good hamburger. I, I wonder if manna tastes on, like what you were hungry for that day. I know it was angel's food. But could it have been, ooh, I want a good burrito. And that manna tastes just like a good old carne asada. And they complained about it. They didn't have to knead it. They didn't have to build a fire and bake it. They just had to go collect it. Now, I know they did do various things to cultivated or, or to prepare it. The, the point is the hard work was done. God provided in the midst of nowhere. And yet they still complain. Now I had a, a medical physician share with me one time that those optimistic Christians, his words not mine, those who are always looking for a silver lining, those who you know try to see the best in bad circumstances, it's just a coping mechanism. What else are they going to do? They're going to say, God is working. God has a reason. God has a plan. How, how do they reconcile their tragedy? Can I just say, they're, they're right. That having a thankful heart and the ability to compare ourselves, hey, I lost my house, but I've got my son. Hey, uh, I lost my 401K, but I, I still got my health. And that is a coping mechanism and is what God has put in us because we know in part and we understand in part and we have to trust the Lord. And even though we don't like what we're going through, we know he's got a plan for us and for us to complain about it. Jill and I were at Universal Studios. That's kind of our little vacation. We still have, we're still addicted to roller coasters. You pray for us on that one. And I tell people it's just rapture practice. We just... Love it. I'm a kid at heart. And if you don't know, it costs several hundreds of dollars per person to get in that park for a day or two. And then parking's $20 a day. And a meal for a couple people is probably 30 40 bucks. And, and if you get express passes, it's an upgrade. And if you do this, it's an upgrade. You can A, a family of four can spend a lot of money in 24 40 hours. Now, we're pretty frugal, so you don't worry about us. We're almost to where we can get our AARP discount, so you just pray about that. We're pretty frugal, okay? I literally saw a kid that was too big and should have known a lot better. If you're three, four, five, I cut you a lot of grace. In it. You're just tired. You start being 9, 10, 11, and you sit there and pout and throw a fit and embarrass your parents. I ain't going nowhere. I ain't having no fun. This place is awful. Just because I don't get to do what I want to do. The spirit of a father just ran all over. I caught myself wanting to say, boy, I didn't do it. I didn't. I wanted to do it. I didn't. I didn't do it. Now, do you understand what that invokes? Do you not realize the 
sacrifice of parents that took off work and probably came a long distance at their own expense and hotels and other meals and and they might have had to work overtime they might have might have had to work double time they had to work remotely they might have had to do without other benefits or luxuries and they're trying to show you a good time and all you want to do is complain i'm asking i felt convicted about that see if you're here tonight you're in the united states of america you are blessed We have very little to complain about. You're in a great country when poor people struggle with obesity. I hear people talk about we need uh, fair this and fair that. Listen, the poorest among us, if they want to, can get an education. The poorest among us can pull themselves up if they have a desire. There's other cultures and other nations. I don't care who you are or what you do. You can't change it. If you're born in one level of society, you're stuck there, and there is no moving. There is no hope. There is no upward mobility. I hear people say, well, we need fair health care. Listen, when it comes to health care and services, we're in the best place in the world. Nobody has refused care. Hey, I would like to have more perks, benefits, and whistles. Hey, I wished everything was for free, but ain't nothing free. But my point is, we are in a great place. We can, we can do better. We can strive to be the best we can be. But we should not be perpetual complainers when we compare ourselves to the less fortunate. Many of you probably remember the apostolic preacher's name was Don Johnson preacher songwriter he was a personal friend of my granddad's in about 1975 he released a song god's been so good to me comma i can't complain he shared the personal testimony of the inspiration for this song he said i was forced to go with my wife to one of her family reunions he said they all drank They all smoked. Half of them had been incarcerated that year. We had nothing in common. I didn't want to go hang out with that group of people. And he said, on the way home, I turned to my wife, and he said, my wife, a godly conundrum, a a miracle, an anomaly, how she came out of that environment became such the good person she was, was a miracle. And he said, the Lord smote me. He said, Don, you can sit here and berate your wife and complain about her family, or you can have the revelation that God has been very good to you. I have made up in my mind. I'm going to think of his goodness and all that he's done for me. My life is not perfect. Not everything goes my way. But if I'm ever going to work out my salvation, I cannot stop and complain about it because complaining never gets the three-quarter inch pipe to equal the half-inch pipe so we can have hot water. It's only those who are diligent, who are not distracted, who are not dismayed, who don't give up. It is those that keep working it. Keep working it. I had an experience this week. The Lord dealt with me strongly. You don't know the people. They they may be watching. Someone may tell them. In the state of Tennessee, we've got multiple departments. One of those departments is the children's department. And they head up a lot of children's camps and do a lot of good work throughout our district. We have a new Tennessee district uh, children's department secretary. His name's Bill Terry. And all we, I don't, I know Brother Terry, he knows me. He, he's, uh, we've invited him to come. It didn't work out on our schedule. Uh, he's very kind and respectful to me in the ministry of this church. And, and I just love his spirit and his attitude. And I don't know him that well. But all week long last week, the Lord kept laying him on my heart. You ever had that? Just can't shake it. Sister Dismukes, I finally yielded. Okay, Lord, I'm going to reach out to him. I don't know if y'all, am I the only one that delays and puts it? It's just me. I tell y'all this, I don't know why I don't practice it. The devil's never going to encourage you to encourage somebody else. So if God is calling you to encourage somebody, encourage them. They need it. And so Friday, I worked from home, 
and and I was soaking up some apostolic praise and worship music, and I was feasting on my Bible, working on this morning's sermon. And the Lord said, I'm telling you, reach out to him. I'm, he's going to think, who am I? We don't know each other that well. And I just sent him a text message. And I said, hey, Brother Terry, Brother Sadler, just wanted you to know that you have been on my heart all week. I love you, and I'm praying for you and your family. And I mean, 30 seconds, he came back and said, Oh, Brother Sadler, thank you for your text. I am sitting with my wife who is starting her chemotherapy treatment today. Your prayers mean much. What am I complaining about? Teenage daughter, teenage daughter, teenage daughter. They got four beautiful daughter stair steps. I, I've never had to go with my wife to pick out a wig. I've never had to discuss with my children what if God doesn't choose to heal. It was a stark reminder. I sat in our dining room Friday with tears on my cheeks. A reminder. God has been so good to me. He has been faithful in many ways that I'm not even cognizant of. I love the African-American spiritual and will understand it better by and by. I don't know yet. I don't know why the Lord allowed this to happen or that to happen. But when we get there, we're going to have so much more to thank him for when we get a clear picture of what he has saved us from and brought us out of and delivered us through. For me to complain is to say God doesn't have my best interest at heart. For me to complain is to say God doesn't know my needs. For me to complain is to prevent him through my excuses of continuing to work in me and through me. She you stand tonight? This is so superficial, I hate to even mention it. I've had a few comments. Oh, Pastor, you're wearing your hair different. Don't think I'm deceived. I feel my age every morning when I get up. I'm not trying to be like one of these young teenagers. I, I had this Pelion cyst come up on the back of my head. It, it wasn't cancerous, thank the Lord. And the doctor would, where he really says it's more of a nuisance than anything else. And he said, I don't really want to, but we've given it every opportunity to go away, to heal. He did a bunch of treatments and stuff on it, and, and, and it caused the hair to fall out. Had a little... Somebody said, I had the mange. Hurt my feelings. Said I had the mange back there. I didn't know if you know this. That little patch right there, every nerve ending in your body is touching that right there. I just want you to know that. Ask me how I know that. One of the kids of the church, he didn't mean it. He, What's that? Pow. What's that? Pow. Brother Jeff, it went all the way to my toe. I said, I got to do something to protect myself. So I grew some hair. I'm tired of people. Now, why did you bring that up? I, I go back to my analogy. And I caught myself, such Angie, grumbling, Lord, how could you let this happen? Can't believe it. And I try to do all this. And when I hear what some other people are going through, <laughs> what have I got to complain about? Am I being real? Now you're saying, Pastor, what, how, you, how are we going to move from here? This morning we talked about the power of what happens in the altar. I'm asking this. You don't have to come up here. You can pray in your seat. You can turn around right to your chair. You can lift your hands towards heaven. But for just a minute tonight, why don't you ask the Lord if there's an area in your life he wants to continue to help you work it out. I don't want to miss heaven by this much, do you? I don't want to miss heaven by this much, do you? I want to make heaven. I want to make sure I've worked it all out. He's took care of the inside. I want to do my part to make sure my outward appearance, my attitude, my actions, my thoughts, my compassion is where it needs to be. Sister Beth's going to lead us in a course. Now, just find yourself a place to pray and say, Lord, help me today.